Hey guys, Trey here with Camwood Bats, and I'm joined with two special guests today. And as you know, we're on day two, we're talking about hands and bat path. And I can think of no better people to have on this stream right now than we have Wes Helms, 13 year MLB vet. And we have none other than eight time all-star, 1999 ML MVP and Hall of Famer Chipper Jones. So Chipper, how you doing, buddy? Doing well, guys. Good to see Wes again. Haven't seen him in forever. And uh looking forward to talking a little hitting. Well, that's the thing, as you know, day two is all about bat path and the proper bat path. So, you know, one of the main things that we teach and that we talk about is staying inside the ball. To me personally, I think staying inside the ball is the number one key to hitting. Right. I've seen players with terrible lower halves but know how to keep their hands inside the ball and still have some success, right? So I always teach my players first how to stay inside the ball. So, um, Trevor, what does that mean to you to stay inside the ball? Because I think a lot of kids have a misconception of that term. Well, we've ar you already said something that, that pertains to my swing um, back in the day, and, and that was that you don't have to do everything fundamentally correct in the lower half as long as you stay over top of yourself you know, on, with the upper half, my, my, I always used to leak, um, to the pool side, maybe from both sides of the plate, but my upper body stayed centered, um, you know, over the plate. So I, I could allow the ball to travel and still, uh, drive the ball the other way. One thing I always say, mm -hmm. whenever I'm talking to hitters for the first time, you get 10 balls down the middle and you try to hook them around the left field foul pole, how many balls are you going to nut, let's say? How many balls are you going to send? Well, the answer is normally probably about three or four. You know, you're going to hook a bunch of balls. You're going to hit balls off the end of the bats and such. Now, you take those same 10 pitches and you try to knock down the center field wall with it, how many are you going to center? At this level, at the big league level, you're probably going to center anywhere between seven and nine balls. So why would your approach change come game time, okay? If you let the ball travel, your, your, your odds of centering said pitch, are they go up exponentially, all right? If you get the bat head out in front and you're trying to hook stuff around a left field foul pole, your contact point's going to, you know, it's going to be very sporadic. You try and knock down the center field fence most of the time, um that contact point picks up and that's one of the main things that i tell my players is obviously today everyone tries to pull the ball you know everyone likes to try to hit the home runs but obviously we teach the approach of you know look for opposite field and shoot it the opposite way and use the entire field but whenever a player is just trying to pull everything like you were saying their contact point becomes very minimal so their timing has to be perfect in order for them to barrel that ball up whereas if you stay inside the ball you know, you're prolonging that length and that time you're barreling that sweet spots on that path. I think I think what's been lost in translation is the fact that, okay, we need we need our bat to be in the zone this long. They're teaching nowadays, well, I want you to come up through the zone, which means your bat's only in the zone this much. That's why I got hitting 220, 230, 240. Yeah, they're 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 gonna time up some three, four, and five starters. Uh, up every once in a while and hit their 25 homers. Um, and to be honest with you, it's getting paid, you know, in, in this day and age. But I just can't – I can't get away from how I was raised. I was raised to be a 300 hitter. I was raised to be as tough and out as possible every single time I went up there. I was concerned with uh, 300, 400, 500. I wanted a 300 – uh, average. I wanted a 400 on base and I wanted a 500 slug. And I knew that if I stayed inside the baseball, the 500 slug would follow. And that's a good point, Chip, because for me, it's all about consistency. And I was blessed to come up with you guys in Atlanta for my first, you know, when I first got to the big leagues to be around the veteran guys, to be around, you know, you and Bobby Cox that taught the game the way it was supposed to be played. Uh, you know, that molded me into the big leaguer. I became and to me, it all revolved around consistency and watching you and watching, you know, all the, you know, with Andrew Jones and all those guys with, uh, you know, Julio Franco. I mean, you know, we could throw him in the mix. Uh, just how you guys every day took BP and stayed inside the baseball 
and, you know, did not think about driving the ball out of the ballpark. You knew you could do that on the mistake pitches. And I think, like you said, in today's game, I think they think about driving the ball the ballpark first and then the base hit second. I'll never forget that time when we had Gary Sheffield, uh, Gary Sheffield there in Atlanta, and he was struggling. And, um, and I'll never forget, he called Barry Bonds up because they were good friends, and Barry Bonds told him, said, hey, I want you to think about hitting a single first. I want you to think about using your hands and hitting a single. The home runs will come. And I'll never forget it. We were in Chicago playing the Cubs. And that BP that day, he just started peppering, you know, line drives to second base and BP, hitting it off the L screen. And then the next thing I know, he just took off. And I'll never forget that. When Barry Bonds told him, think single, think hands, think your bat path, and the home runs will come. And that goes with what you're talking about. Well, and <clears throat> you don't know how many times during the course of, of my career that I had to sit back, you know, laying in bed that night and say, I got to go back to square one. I got to get off the tee. I got to, you know, my, I got to get back to my base swing. My base swing is sitting there on a tee and driving as many balls into the back of the cage without hitting the top or the sides because the tee will never lie to you. If you're doing something wrong, if you're coming around it, guess what? You're going to top it, all right? If you're coming from underneath, guess what? You're going to pop it up. You're going to hit the tee first. But if you're pepper in the back of that, cage with line drive after line drive you are number one staying inside of it and number two your timing is impeccable all right so that's what you try and get back to and and my dad would always say when i was struggling hey play pepper with the left fielder play pepper with the right fielder the off fielder let the ball travel hit a line drive then all of a sudden you hit that line drive to the left you get that base hit now you're like i got it you know and then all of a sudden the next one's a double in the gap, and the next one, you know, carries out of the ballpark for a homer, and here we go. We're on a we're on a hitting streak. Exactly, and that's one of the craziest things is you'll see a player go through a massive slump, right? They're struggling at the plate, and they start to come out of it, and they'll interview them after the game. They're like, well, what did you do to come out of that slump? Nine times out of ten, they say, I started focusing the other way and not trying to pull the ball, right? And what blows my mind is if that's what got you out of the slump and that's what got you going – why don't you maintain that approach throughout every at bat? You know, once they get out, they start trying to go back to pulling the ball and they'll fall right back into it. There is nothing more dangerous in the game than a guy that can do damage from foul pole to foul pole. The guys that, that strictly relegate themselves to half of the field, those are the guys that sitting in those hitters and pitchers meetings with Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz. If a guy relegated himself to half the field, those are the guys that they went after. The guys that could go foul pole to foul pole for damage, pitch around them. You know, you pitch carefully to them. You don't let them beat you. The guys that relegate themselves to half the field, those are the guys they went after and exploited every single lineup that we ever faced. And that ought to tell you everything you ought to know. One thing I ask all hitters when I start working with them, what kind of hitter do you want to be? Because I don't want to waste my time trying to get you to be uh, efficient foul pole to foul pole when all you want to do is stand on the, on the plate and yank. If you want to stand on the plate and yank, I can help you do that too, <laughs> you know? But it's, it's kind of out of my character. I've only had one, one player ever, ever say I want to stand on the plate and yank, okay? That was Brian McCann. Okay, and for a couple of years, you know, playing in, in Houston and in New York, those parks were kind of conducive to standing on the plate and yanking. When he came back at the end of his career, the first day in spring training, he comes up to me, he goes, ask me again. And I go, what kind of hitter do you want to be? He goes, I want to go from foul pole to foul pole. I was like, it's a little late in your career, but I'll still help you do it, you know? But it took them – it took guys like like him and Jeff Francoeur that, you know, who I still call Captain Caveman. He just he just up there hacking, you know. <laughs> um, it took guys like that going through the league and experiencing the struggles that come with that approach to come back around full circle later on in their career and say, I messed up. Let's fix it now. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things like I'm, I'm a, I grew up a big Braves fan. So, you know, you see guys hitting like Freddie Freeman, 
And most recently, you can tell Austin Riley took a change with his approach at the plate. You know, and he had a hell of a year this past season. But you could see they started – or Austin started using the entire field, and that's what allowed him to start being that better hitter. And the averages started to go up, and the power numbers uh, went up as well. Well, Austin – Austin – we didn't change anything mechanically with Austin. There's nothing wrong with Austin's swing. We just changed his sights. We, you know, as opposed to, to, to trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark from left center field to the foul pole, like we were talking about earlier, we got a huge state farm sign in right center field, right there in the middle of our bullpen. And I'm like, Austin, I'm telling you, if you try and knock down that state farm sign, every single pitch, a couple of things are going to happen. Your contact point's going to pick up because you're going to let the ball travel. You're going to, uh, you're, you're going to, you're going to, uh, have, your bat path is going to stay in the zone longer. Therefore, you're going to make more contact. Secondly, your chase rate on pitches outside the zone is going to go down. Why? Because you're allowing the ball to travel. Now that slider that's off the plate that's been giving you trouble, you see it now because your sights have changed. You're not flying open to try and get the head out to hit it to left. You're letting it travel and trying to hit it out to right. Now your chase rate goes down. You've seen his his strikeouts go down, his walks go up for just for the simple fact of changing his sights from left center to right center. Jim, that's a good point. Uh I don't know if you remember it. I mean, it's been a long time ago, but one of my changing points in my hitting was when you told me to change my direction. I was top hand dominant. And, you know, I get out front, I would roll my top hand and everything. And all you told me one time in BP was change my direction of the field. You did not mention one thing mechanically to me or anything. You said, change your direction. I want you to shift the field to right center. And when I started doing that, it started training me to – you know, not only mentally, but it trained my body the right way to work as well, just because the ball, the ball was traveling more and it was getting me into a better hitting position consistently. And I'll never forget that. About a week later, the Giants came to town and Alan Embry was uh, was on the mound. And I'll never forget, he was throwing, what, upper 90s. He was living away from me. And all I remember is hitting the ball right center out of Turner Field. And that's when it hit me with what you told me. Like, you don't have to cheat to get to these guys. You can still let the ball travel no matter how hard they throw. You don't have to go get it. And that's when it changed me as a player, uh, you know, being more consistent hitting was just, you know, changing the direction of the field. Well, and you had a product. You, I mean, you had a, a swing that was tailor made for up the middle and the other way. You know, you just, you just didn't really realize it. Like right. it's hard not to, with a guy out there throwing a hundred, I hate to say cheat um, because it's not cheating. It's anticipating, you know, I mean, we do our homework and preparations, you know, that's, that's three quarters of the battle. I mean, you know, we know before we walk to the plate, what pitch we want to put in play. And you mentioned Alan Embry. Okay. Alan Embry. Yeah. He threw a hundred miles an hour. He didn't have nothing else. You knew nope. what was coming. So you could anticipate right. you know, a hundred miles an hour. Now, if he's staying away and you're trying to hit the ball out to, to left center, what's going to happen? You're going to hit a ground ball to short or third, you know? But if you stay on it, let it travel, you don't have to swing hard. you got to get the bat head where it's supposed to be and let 100 miles an hour provide all the power, all right? That, everybody always said, man, it looked like you didn't even swing at that. Well, I got, I got 35 inches and 34 ounces where it needed to be. And I let them provide all the power. That was, you know, right. I, that was the secret. But, you know, I mean, we all go through streaks where we get big, where we, you know, I had the toe tap. Whenever I followed my toe tap out, I would lunge. You know, I hit a ton of ground balls the first and second base. I was by no, by no means, you know, perfect. But when I was right, I learned from, from the big three pitchers and Leo Mazzoni. What's the first thing he said? Every pitchers meeting we are going to own the fastball on the outside corner for strike one that's their approach all right and these are the best guys in the game then what am i doing sitting here trying to trying to pull balls all right i need to make that pitch on the outside corner i'm better off when i get extended get extension anyway so why do i not make that outside corner my strength 
And I take that away from every single pitcher that tries to get ahead of me with a fastball away at first pitch. That's a good point. So, and that, that's the exact approach that we're teaching our players, especially at a young age. As you get more advanced, your approach changes to like sections of the plate and whatnot. But, you know, as a young player, what really helped me was I'm looking for that fastball away to drive away, to drive off that right center field wall, and I react to anything inside. And right. if you can have that approach, that's what allowed me to go from a 180 hitter to a Division I All-American in just three years, is I really bought into that approach of using the entire field. And the main thing for me was I didn't think I had that power to right center. That was the reason I was trying to pull everything. But the moment that I hit that fastball away off the right center field wall, my entire game opened up, and that's when I became, you know, a much better hitter. So whenever you're working with a player that constantly just wants to yank and pull the ball, and now they want to start using the full field, uh, what's some of the things that you do in the, uh, in the cage and off the tee to allow them to stay inside that ball and open up all parts of the field when they're hitting? Well, we have to – we've got to work from the ground up. I mean, uh, one of the most important things is balance, okay? So – we have to keep our head still, all right? So our eyes stay still. The best way to do that is to be bounced, okay? Less our head moves, less our eyes moves, more we see the actual pitch. So what I try to get, like say, um, I did this with Brian McCann, I did this with Matt Diaz, and they were having trouble uh, letting the ball travel. And it's because they had for so long been trying to get the bat head out in front, trying to pull. And I said to the guys, okay, we are going to, I want you to take a swing and I want your back knee. Okay. So when you, when you're, when you're getting ready, all right, you're probably 60, 40 with your weight on your back leg. All right. A bent back leg. All right. I never want you to extend your back leg. I want you to keep your back leg bent through your entire swing and if you sit there and you mimic that it's virtually impossible for you to take an off balance swing where the balance where the off balance swing comes from is when your back knee extends which means you push forward you lunge okay if that back knee stays and i and i, I sat and i watched albert pujols for basically 10 or 12 years, never taken off balance swing. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And I go, what's the common denominator? His back leg never bends. He sits on it. Like he literally pivots and sits on it. And it's virtually impossible for you to take an off balance swing. And that, that mindset or that thought for those two guys work tremendously. I was like, put a rod, you know, when you finish your swing, you should have a rod right through your back knee, all the way up through your hips and your, and your shoulders. And I mean, you should, you should be centered and they loved it. And, and yeah. I've just, I've had a lot of success telling guys um, that once you set up, get ready for the pitch, don't come off that backside. So I know one of the main things that I tell my players is, you know, whenever when I first start working with a player, we go straight to the tee and we go straight to we set it up on the outside corner of the plate where we're mimicking that outside fastball. And, you know, one of the big I'm a visualization guy and I try to simplify things. So, you know, whenever you're hitting on the mat, you have that white line that goes right down the mat right in front of you. Right. I tell my players, I want you to drive your hands right down that line on that mat. Because if you can simplify it just like that, just drive your hands down that mat, the barrel is going to naturally follow through the zone inside that ball. And you're going to get that proper extension, hit that hard line drop to the opposite field gap. So that's like the number one thing I'll do with my players when I first start working with them. That's so good. That is so good. That's exactly what I told Freddie Freeman when he's coming up. You know, we got those those AstroTurf mats in the, in the cages and whatnot. And they got the plate and those two lines on the inside corner. And I go, Freddie, I want you to take that knob right down. And the bat path is just, just follows and it's fluid and you're, you stay inside of everything you get. You arc around that white line. Things are going to go sideways, but man, that, that, that's good stuff. You're, you're doing the right thing as far as uh, 
keeping those guys inside the, the, the baseball and, and promoting good bat pat. Exactly. Because I know I was working with one of my players uh, at Florida. You know, he was a high school Mr. Florida, so he's one of the top players in the country. And he's at Florida now. And we're hitting the cage off the tee, just warming up. He rolls over three or four pitches in a row. And I asked him, like, what are you thinking about when you're hitting off the tee right now? And he's like, I'm just warming up. You know, I'm just swinging. And you're not thinking about anything. So I said, all right, I want you to relax your hands and just focus on one thing. We're going to simplify it. How quick can you pull that knob down that line towards the pitcher? And that's it. Just focus on pulling those hands down that line and let the barrel follow through naturally. He hit four or five in a row, just rockets the right center field. And he turned around and looked at me and he said, where the hell did you learn that? Like, I've never <laughs> heard it that simple before. And that, we actually got that from Rod Carew. So. This is what you do. You know, I mean, I heard a great quote the other day. It was the difference between amateurs and professionals. And it was something to the effect of amateurs practice to get to get something right. And uh, pros practice to never get it wrong. You know, and and that's the the kind of repetition, repetition, repetition. Like we can't do it wrong, you know. One, I mean, I've taken so many balls off the off the tee. I could go out there right now and picked up a bat in years, you know. And I guarantee you, you give me ten swings off the tee, and I'll throw seven or eight right into the back of the right into the back of the cage. It's so it's like riding a bike. It's so ingrained. I mean, we've done it so many times, um, but that's what it takes, you know, to to play at this level it's got a you've got the game is so fast you know people always say i can't believe you know when they watch a game from right behind home plate how fast the game is and i was like there for years it was like playing slow pitch softball you know because we we just we did it in our sleep we did it over and over and over and i don't think that that a lot of times uh, kids realize the amount of repetition, amount of work that's gone into, you know, playing 23 years in the big leagues or 13 years in the big leagues like West did. Well, that's a good point, Chipper. I mean, you could hit on that just a little more. I think one of the biggest things, too, that Trey and I like to emphasize to kids is the importance of that routine. I think a lot of young players don't realize the discipline that has to go into doing it day in and day out. Baseball is not like football and these other sports where it's such a skill that has to be practiced every single day. You have to do so many reps a day. You got to be disciplined in what you're doing with those reps. I mean, you have to build that muscle memory that you've got in the game. You got to do it without thinking your body has to react a split second. And the only way you can do that is to come off a good routine every day and be disciplined with it. Well, preparation is everything. Um, you know, you know, from being around me that, you know, it's, it's, I'm at the ballpark at one thirty for seven, seven o'clock game. I'm at the ballpark at one thirty, getting treatment. Uh, but th as far as the, 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 the preparation for that, that night's game, I'm literally the night before thinking about the guy I'm facing. All right. So when I get there, I've already got a little bit of a, a clue as to what my game plan is going to be that night. But it doesn't stop there. I go into the uh, video room and I want to I, I watch his last three starts. OK, because I want to know where his head's at. Is he three and oh? You know, I mean, is he three and oh with a one five ERA? I mean, is he hot? Is he is he oh and three? You know, I mean, is he down on his luck? I mean, is he, you know, where's his head at? Is he 0-0 and with three no decisions? Has he pitched well, just hadn't gotten the W? All these things, you know, um, go into a game plan in a specific night. And then I'll watch the last 10 ABs that I personally had off of. So I want to know, okay, what was I successful against him doing? What was he successful against me doing? Because I know when the rubber meets the road in the sixth, seventh inning, and he's on the verge of getting you know, leaving the game, he's going to revert back to what he's been successful against me doing. And that's what I'm going to be sitting on at that particular time. So it's not only the repetition, the physical repetition, it's also the mental work that goes behind a game plan each and every night for every single pitch. Good point. So 
you know, that approach of obviously, you know, like I told you before, we learned from guys like Tony Gwynn and Rod Carew, you know, obviously that's where we learn how to stay inside the ball, but can you pinpoint the time when you learned that concept and when that concept really hit home with you? And once you did it, you realize, you know, this is the approach I need to take to get where I want to go and become that, you know, the big leader. And like you were a hall of famer and one of the best hitters in the game. I think, um, there were a couple different times, um, you know, when I was in the minors and still getting used to switch hitting, um, it clicked for me my first full year in, in Macon, um, where my left-handed swing became my, my natural swing. I'm a natural right-handed hitter, but my left-handed swing became my natural side. That was one light bulb moment. There was another time, um, in my rookie season where I said to myself, I got to, I got to stop swinging East and West. I got to stop swinging West from the right side of the plate. I got to stop swinging East from the left side of the plate. I got to start swinging North. Okay. North to center field. Once I got the feel of where the bat barrel was, when I, when I made contact to the north, it was just a subtle adjustment to go northeast and northwest, you know? It was just a little subtle adjustment, but I was still staying from gap to gap. Yes, I hit some home runs down the line, but Wes will tell you 90% of my homers were to the big part of the field because I was concentrating on swinging north, all right? Swinging north keeps me inside the baseball. It lets the ball travel a hair longer, and the, 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 the results are going to follow, I can promise you. Exactly. And that's where, like, obviously you stay inside that ball. Like you said, you are going to pull some home runs down the line. But when you do that, it's because you're staying inside that ball and you just got fooled. You're a little bit out front on that pitch, and you're catching a little bit further out than normal. And that's when well, you hit the, those. The ball that I pulled, okay, because I was – 95% of the time sitting fastball middle away. Yep. The ball that I pulled was the hanging slider, the cement yep. mixer on the middle that I was like, okay, center, center, up, oh, hanger, you know, and I just flipped, you know, or, or the hanging changeup. It, it, it was almost an accident because that guy made that mistake, but I had the right approach to stay up the middle and the other way. And then all of a sudden he hangs it and you just clip it a little out front. That's the ball that goes down the line. And that's why I tell kids, if you're focused on pulling the ball and you get that hanger, that breaking ball, and you are just a little bit fooled out front, you're that's gonna a pull capper it. off the rim and you're going you're gonna to either pull it foul or you're going to ground <clears throat> out to the first baseman or the third baseman every time. 100%. 100%. If I could just ingrain into every teenager's mind, that there is more money to be made from gap to gap than than down the lines, man, some boys would make some serious money. Because if I'd have had people telling me that, you know, early on, you know, I mean, it's such a it's such a a an advantage uh, to stay inside the baseball and try and hit the ball to the big part of the field. Well, last thing I want to say, Chipper, on, you know, I know you hit on it early in the conversation about, you know, in today's game, the 220 hitter is getting paid 15 to $20 million and stuff. So kids see that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we're kind of fighting an uphill battle and everything. But what I like to emphasize to young hitters and is and I go always go back to consistency. I use you as a reference all the time just because, you know, I came up with you. I watched you when I was in Atlanta. And the, the way that you hit and staying inside the baseball plays to win. And I always tell, like, do you want to be a hitter that just makes money or do you want to be a hitter that helps your team win? And I mean, it's, you know, some straddle the fence with that. Everybody wants to make the money, and I get that. But I always stress the kids, you know, the way that, you know, you talk hitting and the way that we preach it is this is going to win games for you. This is going to beat the best pitchers like you said you don't want to face the four and five starters you want to beat the number one number two guys I can remember you know I think the biggest thing that stands out to me with you Chipper wasn't your uh, Hall of Fame career with your numbers it was 
the way you, your two strikes, when you got to two strikes, I can remember sitting in the dugout watching you, and your butt would be here, and all of a sudden you just take your hands and flip it through the hole the other way. And mm-hmm. you never let that pitcher beat you. And that was the thing that stood out to me was your bat path and your uh, approach to hitting played against the best of the best. And that's the kind of hitter I preach to these young kids. Be that hitter. Don't be the guy – that hits 220 with 30 homers. And if you go back and look at the track record, it's probably off the guys that weren't the best of the best. I want to see you your numbers against the number one, two, and three starters, your back end of the bullpen guys. Those are the guys you gotta beat to win games. Right. So well, you're not you're not gonna you're you're not gonna beat the Jacob DeGroms and the Max Scherzers and the Clayton Kershaws and the Verlanders, you're not going to beat them hitting three or four homers off of them. You're going to beat them by getting, a, you know, get, getting a leadoff double and guy hitting a ground ball to second base. And then a guy, you know, if the infield's back, hitting a ground ball to short. Or if the infield's in, hitting a fly ball to center field. That's how you beat those guys. Okay. Because you don't, you're not going to, you're not going to string together hits. You're not going to hit multiple homers. You got to beat them two to one. And, if you're up there trying to do maximum damage against a guy who doesn't give up maximum damage, you got to take what those guys give you. You have to be honest with yourself in judging a pitcher's strengths and weaknesses against yours. There were many pitchers throughout my career that I sat back and said, I'll never take this guy deep. He's got one pitch that I just can't see. I can't pick it up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for the one that I think I can put in play, and I'm going to pepper the left fielder with a single, and I'm going to let somebody else who maybe does see him a little better do their thing. You know, that's how you win. You are trying to be the toughest out possible every single time at the plate. I I can, can't tell you how many times I was, we're getting our brains beat in, you know, nine to nothing. And I come up with two outs in the ninth and I'm like, I'm not going to be the last out of this game. Somebody else is going to be, it ain't going to be me. And I salvaged the day with a one for four, just because I challenged myself, you know? I mean, it's little, it's little things like that. You know I mean? I, no, Randy Johnson ain't throwing a no hitter against me. I'm gonna get a base hit. Well, he threw a perfect game against us, but you know what I mean. It's that kind of mindset. that's like, no, nah, he's not no hitting us as long as I got you know something to say, something to say about it. It's, I think the good players they they find these little ways to to challenge themselves mentally, even when they they know that the writing is on the wall and you're probably gonna gonna take an L that night. I don't like 0 for fours, man. I hate 0 for four. I hate 0 for fives even worse. Those are the ones that kill you. But if you can sneak out an 0 for three or 0 for two with two walks, 0 for three with a walk and a, or a sack fly, uh, you know, salvage that one for four, salvage that one for five, man, those are the things that keep you afloat, keep you from going into those 0 for 25s that are killers during the, during the middle of the year. Exactly. And uh, I just, we just have one more question for you real quick. And you touched on it earlier. You know, the bat that you used in game was 35 inches, 34 ounces, just a tree log right. pretty right. much. Right. And, you know, one of the things that we do is, you know, we train with these Camwood bats, which I don't know if you've ever seen these before. Obviously the weights add right above the hands. Right. And it's a plus 12. So this 33 is 45 ounces. Oh, wow. And the reason for this bat is like you were saying, we're trying to teach you how to stay inside the ball, right? And if you can keep your hands inside the ball and you let the barrel naturally follow through the zone, it really doesn't matter the weight of the bat that you swing because your hand path is proper, right? Because you're just pulling that knob inside the ball. But if your hands come out away from you at all, you're going to feel all of that weight, right? So it's kind of like whenever you're swinging that bat, a lot of people are going to ask you, how did you swing that heavy of a bat? And it's going to be because of your bat path and your hands were on point. When I was a, <clears throat> when I was in rookie ball, my first hitting instructor was Willie Stargell. He gave me a 36, 36 K44 bat. I mean, this thing was swinging me. I was 6'3", 180 pounds. You know what I mean? But he told me he was like, "You swing when when you're when you're facing live pitching in a game, 
I got to have you swinging as heavy a bat as you can get around on 90 miles an hour. Okay. That's what he always told me. I took that bat home and started swinging it in the off season. And I, and I found out something that you'll see with <clears throat> some of the golfers who swing these, these extra long drivers trying to get more distance. They don't swing it harder. They, 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 they actually swing it, use, use less, uh, uh, force to try and get it to where it's supposed to be than they, than, than they did with, with a smaller bat, you know? And I just got to the point where I was like, okay, I mean, I can, I can lay the bat on the ball on the outside corner. I can, as long as I don't get big, I can lay that bat head on the ball on the inside corner. I can still swing North and gradually you start to, to figure out how much energy you have to, uh, put out to be able to get the bat head to where it's supposed to be at 90 at 95 miles an hour. Yeah. I mean, me and Wes were big boys. You know, I was, I probably played at six, three, two twenty five. He was probably two thirty five, two forty. We're big boys. You don't have to swing the ball hard, swing the bat hard. If you're trying to match a hundred miles an hour off the mound with a, with a, a hundred mile an hour swing, how many times are you going to center that? Not very often. Not very often, but if you get your foot down nice and quiet and you swing that bat at 80, 85%, you're going to center a lot more balls. So that allowed me to swing a heavier bat. Now, if I was taking that same approach with a 31 and a half ounce bat, I would be responsible for trying to match 100 miles an hour with a 100 mile an hour swing. And that, that just that's just not me. So less is sometimes more when it comes to the swing. Now, everybody throws 100. Everybody throws 100. It's, it's fast pitch softball. It's homers and strikeouts, okay? So what I try and tell guys is be quiet with your front foot. Get it down. Get it down. The swing will follow from there. If you're hard on your front side, you're going to have a rigid swing. Your eyes are going to be moving. You're going to have a, a an off balance swing, but if you get it down and you're fluid in doing so, chances of centering 100 miles an hour are pretty good. That's good stuff. Well, Chipper, I appreciate you coming on, buddy. I said we don't want to take up much more of your time. We've been going for almost 40 minutes now, so <laughs> I said I enjoyed having you on and just talking hitting. Well, I enjoyed being with y'all, Wes. Good to see you again, and uh, you know, anytime we can, we can, we can, we can, we can do this anytime you guys want. I. I you guys are doing a great thing, and uh, kudos to you guys. Chipper, I appreciate it, man. You know, as always, it's an honor playing with you. Uh, I was your protege as you signed my jersey and said it. Uh, <laughs> I will always, no, seriously, you always have a special place in my heart, you guys in Atlanta. So, uh, but I'll be seeing you around with the Braves alumni stuff and everything. So, I really appreciate you doing this. All right, guys. Y'all take it easy. See you, Chipper.